Welcome to those of you joining us uh, by video. Tonight we're reading from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 20. But for what we were doing last week, let's go back just to cover the area from verse number 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house or a stately mansion, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also earthenware of wood and of earth, and some to honor, some for noble purposes, and some for not so noble purposes. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, set apart, and meet for the master's use, very useful to the Lord, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of this snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now we come right in again at verse number 18 to the image of the bad workman. Last week we saw the skilled Bible teacher at work as a man going to plow, plowing a very straight furrow. As a civil engineer laying out a motorway or a freeway, going straight. So the skilled Bible teacher in the hand of God as he takes the Word of God and teaches young people and older people and boys and girls the Scriptures. He goes very straight, and if he's rightly dividing God's truth, then the people will not be confused. They'll follow on to blessing. But unfortunately, there are those who will rise within the ranks of the Christian church who will not be good workmen. They will be bad workmen. And instead of plowing a straight furrow, Paul switches again, what a writer he is, and picks up another metaphor. He says, this time it's not plowing a straight furrow, it is the archer. How well we remember that famous girl from Lisburn in the Ulster representing Northern Ireland in the Commonwealth Games. And do you remember that tremendous effort she made in archery? And I always remember how that she just missed it by a whisker. A few points getting the gold medal and how very gracious she was about it. How proud we were of her, representing a very good side of our beloved province that a lot of people aren't aware of across the world. 
And I remember watching that girl aiming for the target. But here is the archer, he says, at work. And the word is that he swerves from the target. Notice verse 18. It is as though the truth, the Word of God, is like a target with a bullseye in it. And here comes this, this archer and uh, a preacher, if you like. Let's mix our metaphors. And he, he starts to teach the Scriptures. But instead of aiming to teach God's Word and say exactly what it says, he swerves away from the target and his arrow heads away out across the country. And this metaphor, of course, is, is very apt. It means that he sets out, and you would think he's going to hit the bullseye, hit the target, but he misses the mark. He deviates. He swerves from the target. Now, obviously, he was entrusted with the Word of God. But a very fascinating thing is, you see, that here are all the spectators watching him or her. And as it goes out, suddenly it swerves away from the target, and all the spectators follow it. Now, Wimbledon's coming up soon. Oh, my. I might as well retire out of the house for a fortnight when Wimbledon comes. And uh, it's fascinating on how the nation gets involved. And uh, you remember that television ad that I forget what it was about now, where they have the people watching the ball going from one end to the other. And how on earth they sit at Wimbledon all day and go like this for hours on end. They must be absolutely dizzy, especially when that uh, gentleman from New York is playing. Mr. McEnroe, but the fact is that, you know, spectators watch a sport. And obviously, archery was a sport in Paul's time. And, and he is implying that as these fellows, if they were a bad archer, would swerve away, so the spectators would watch the arrow where it goes. They would themselves be led astray in their sight if he misses the target. And that is exactly what happens. Whenever somebody takes the Word of God and aims to preach it, but deviates away from the truth, if it's straight on the target, the people will see it straight. If it's crooked, the people will see it crooked. And people can follow. So it is very important that when we are preaching the Word, that we aim straight, because if we aim at nothing, we're sure to hit it. Now, notice that he says, I'll tell you two men, he said, that you know very well who have done this very thing. Notice verse 17. These men have swerved from preaching the truth, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have missed the target saying that the resurrection is past already, and they overthrow the faith of some. Now, obviously, these two Bible teachers had risen up, and they had taught that uh, there was no bodily resurrection to come. Now, Christians believe that if a Christian dies on earth before the Lord comes, their body goes into the earth. But that when the Lord appears... At the last trump, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Christians are waiting for the return of their Lord, that trump. And our loved ones who have died in Christ, they'll come out first, a bodily resurrection. So that, I know I've taught this before, but it's important. If you're standing around a graveside of one of your loved ones, and somebody is standing there preaching and saying, O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? And the tears are pouring down your face. You know very well that that seems to deny something. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Because it's very obvious that death has had a victory and the grave has a sting. 
So you see, the Bible teaches very clearly that it is inaccurate to say at a graveside, O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, uh, O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? It teaches in Paul's letter to Corinthians that when this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And when the dead in Christ rise out of their graves, their souls already with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, if you die now before the Lord comes, if you're a Christian, but the, 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 the body comes out, and as it comes out, and uh, that, that tremendous resurrection, then as it comes out, that soul will be able to say, ha ha, where's your victory now, death? And where's your victory now, grave? It is a victory until that happens, isn't it? And the Lord Jesus procured that great victory at Calvary, and in that coming day it will be seen. What a day, glorious day that will be. So, let's not get it mixed up. It's very important that we remember that that's what that statement is for. Now, Paul taught this. You'll read that in Thessalonians. For those of you who are just baby Christians, come to know the Lord recently. You've never heard this truth before. I've always got to remember that, that in this congregation there are people who have never heard these things before. And I can't take it for granted that you all know these things. So, just remember... 1 Thessalonians 4 is the chapter for you before you go to sleep tonight. And there you'll find this truth taught. But these fellows were saying, well, you know, the bodily re resurrection, it won't happen. They said it was already past. They were asserting that the promise of resurrection had been entirely fulfilled when by faith and baptism people got saved. They were raised in Christ. And that was the bodily resurrection. There was no future one saying, verse 18, that the resurrection is past already. And these false teachers are marked by this fact that they constantly dispute about words. And what do they do? According to verse 14 of this chapter, notice it. The man who teaches the word, who misses the target, you'll find very often this is what he does. He substitutes the word of truth. Notice your notes one and the first one. He substitutes the word of truth for hair splitting. He will dispute about words for days on end, and he'll substitute what God says for splitting hairs. And that's exactly what verse 14 says. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And unfortunately, I've heard a lot of this. Where sometimes you will get Bible teachers together, and instead of really hitting the mark, they will split hairs. And it's frightening to hear it. And they'll argue about words for a long time. Now, this kind of thing has two effects. When you hear people hair splitting and arguing about words and roots of meanings and so on and so forth, and they're not really teaching you God's Word, it leads you away from the Lord. You get tired of it. You get fed up with it. And people who are fed on this kind of thing, they are led away from God. And many, many pulpits across Britain in these days have had hair splitters I know I'm not the one to be talking about this subject. I know what you're thinking, you lot. But hair splitters in the pulpit who have preached about the differences in words to the extent that they haven't preached God's Word. And you know, a, a, a leading Christian in the land took me aside the other night, and he said to me, you know, Derek, he said, there is a great danger in giving commentaries and what the commentaries say and what the commentaries say about the verse and not actually preaching the Word of God itself, just preaching the commentaries. And that was a word to all of us who preach. Well, it leads people away from God. And then notice in verse 16, it does more than that, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. It leads people away from true spirituality and it advances them onto more and more ungodliness. And the more they go on disputing about words and words and words, and the lovely Lord Jesus, you know, you can't, 
you can't find him in the middle of it all. And it's supposed to be in his name, and it's supposed to be his service, and he's supposed to be Lord, and all you hear is hair splitting and arguments about words, and he is not to the fore. You see, Christ must be central to all true biblical preaching. He must be the one that we're exalting. He must be the one that we're gathering people to. We must preach Christ and him crucified. That is important. Not that words aren't important. They are very important. But let the study of words in Scripture lead us to him, not to ungodliness and argument and disputing and division. And notice what it does. In verse number 14, it ruins the hearers, and it spreads, thirdly, infection in the community. Their word will eat as doth a canker. Mind you, that's frightening, isn't it? The power of the people who say they are teaching the Bible but are not really teaching the Bible but are just merely debating the Bible and arguing about words in the Bible their, their word will start to eat into the very community. What about that word last week about the great John Knox when it says of him that when he preached, the people lived? Because he was preaching the word. And that has happened in days of great revival. When revival, people whose, whose hearts are touched by the Lord and they really preach the word of God, there's power in their preaching. And the people live. The church revives. People are blessed. They can't wait to get there. There's power in it. There's blessing in it. There's refreshment in it. There's challenge in it. Whenever they really hit the mark, but when they veer away off the mark, then the people start to argue among themselves and they start to divide among themselves and God's people divide among themselves and they, they become, they, they start to wander away from the Lord and very often the pulpit can be blamed for much that's happening because it's not giving a certain sound. How can the people be called to battle, says the word, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound? She so asked this very serious. Now, Timothy, look, fellow, he's saying, you've got the head at bull's eye. You've not got the swerve from the target. Preach the word, Timothy, and rightly divide the word of truth. Plus, straight furrow, lovely images. We don't want the, the community to be infected by it. And you know, I could talk about this for a long time. When I think of the paganness of the United Kingdom at the moment, by and large. And I think of tens of thousands, even millions of men and women who have moved away from the Christian faith. It is because very often that when they go to a place of worship, they don't hear the Word of God. They hear a homily or a story or a, or, or, or a little bit of philosophy uh, for 10 minutes, and dear help him if he goes over 10 minutes. And, and, and an excuse of a thing. And there's nothing in it for them. So they move away. There's nothing that can fill a church building like the power of the preaching of the Word. There's nothing that can take the canker out of a city like the power of the preaching of the Word. This can do what politics can never do or politicians can never do. You can't legislate the change of people's hearts. It can't be done through legislation. It can only be done with the Spirit of God working in people's hearts and drawing men and women to the Savior and to the cross in repentance where they are born again. And that comes. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So this is a great passage and we need it in our day. Their teachings are dangerous as blood poisoning to the body and spread like a, like a sepus from a wound whenever they start to teach impure doctrine and don't preach the Word. They upset people's faith, according to verse 18. Overthrow the faith of some. Is there somebody listening to me tonight and you have had your faith overthrown because you've been listening to false doctrine and people who do not preach the Word of God and you've been overwhelmed by philosophy, or you've been overwhelmed by something else, other kind of teaching you've been listening to that's robbed you of the simplicity that's in the Lord Jesus, that even a little child can rejoice in. I know I always tell you, I know, but I enjoy it, about the little lad in Ireland who got saved. 
And the skeptics said to him, How do you know you're saved, son? And he replied, How do you know you're not saved, sir? I know rightly I'm not. Well, said the little boy, I know rightly I am. <laughs> and I often think of that little child. I know rightly I'm not. Well, he said, I know rightly I am. You ask a person who's been born again, and they'll tell you what it's like. Ask a fellow to explain why he's in love. Just ask him to explain it. He's saying, well, I can't explain it. Just happened. What? It just happened. I used to say, well, how would you know when it comes? And they all used to look at me as if I was simple in the head. You'll know, Derek. You'll know. Boy, they were right. All I can say is that it's like a swallow migrating. Ask, him, ask me to explain it. The wind blows where it listeth, said Jesus, and thou hearest the sound thereof, canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. When you are born again, you cannot tell whence it comes or whither it goes in that sense. It comes from the Lord originally, but my, it's a miracle. But you sure know it has happened. I can't explain to you tonight, my friend, why the Lord Jesus loves you or why he loves me. I can't explain that. I, I don't understand that. But when I come here on a Lord's Day morning and we sit down around this table and we remember the Lord in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup, I tell you something I'm beginning to understand. I might not understand why he loves me, but I'm beginning to understand a little of how he loved me. He loved me unto death and loved you unto death. And don't let anybody rob you of oh, that simple, powerful gospel truth that Christ died for the ungodly. And if you're not saved tonight, repent of your sin and put your trust in him. And you'll be saved and know it and have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to guide you and bless you through all of your days. Don't let any people like the archer missing the mark, any bad workman swerving from the target draw you away from the faith that's in Christ Jesus. Don't let your faith be upset. Is there somebody tonight with their faith upset? Don't let them upset you. Don't. That's what Timothy is warned of. Because, verse 19, this is very interesting. Despite the fact that there will, even within the ranks of the Christian church, be men come up who are false Bible teachers. I want to tell you something, Timothy, says Paul. There's one thing that remains absolutely secure. That is the true church of Jesus Christ. It remains secure. The foundation of God standeth sure. The true church of Christ is not based in Geneva. It's not based in some office. It's not a uniting of churches by men. It exists already. It exists not of bricks and mortar, but of people who have come to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior in their heart and lives. The Holy Spirit lives within them. They are part of the Church of Christ universal, and it stands absolutely secure. And there are two seals. There are two seals to this. Having this seal. Number one, the Lord knoweth them that are his. The Lord knows who are truly born-again people who have really rested in his finished work and trusted Christ as their Savior. He knows them. I can't tell them all. There can be some who could have done it, and I wouldn't think they have. There could be others who may have done it, and maybe they haven't, and I thought that they had. But the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let's always remember that. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And then, there is this second visible seal. That's the invisible seal. The Lord knows. But the visible seal of born-again people is they are marked by holiness. Marked by holiness. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I had a letter from a member of this class recently, a very, very serious letter, asking me to speak in public about the fact that many Christians in plain Northern Ireland language are hoax. Now, if you're from England, the Lord bless you. That's got nothing to do with angling. <laughs> or somewhere else, or Scotland, or whatever. They are hooks. They are, they are in business, and they would do you 
as quick as you can look at them. They say they are born again. They have got huge stickers on the back of their cars, prepare to meet thy God, and you'd need to because they do about 93 around corners. <laughs> when they queue up for things, they are nasty. They go around telling everybody and they need to be saved and that they need, you need to be born again, sir, and, and all the rest of it. And then these folk who don't know the Lord look at them and they say, well, if that's what Christianity is, look at them, look at her. And this was a very, very serious letter pleading that I do some exposition because this Christian had discovered a lot of it going on. Fiddling about in all sorts of areas. A friend of mine rang me up on the phone recently, Christian leader in this land, very intelligent man. He said, we've just done a survey of people who say they are born again in Northern Ireland, young people. And we have asked them what they think about premarital sex. And we put it into a computer, what they said. And we are staggered at the statistics that are coming out. But the vast majority of them believe in it. Well, that's what my friend said. I'm not accusing everybody in general of that, but it was frightening. And I can tell you he can stand over what he's saying. Do you believe in that? And say you're the Lord's? Because you see, let him, everyone that nameth the name of Christ, be pure. Depart from iniquity. And I say publicly tonight that the thing, the biggest thing that is holding up revival in Ireland is the Christian church and the state of it. That's what's holding it up. I honestly believe that what we don't need is more evangelistic campaigns. What we need is purity and holiness amongst Christians. And if it was there, and I speak to my own heart just as much as to yours, if it was there in profundity, we could not get the people into this place who would want to come in to see what on earth it is that we have that gives us such purity and such joy. But the vast majority of people out there are saying, those people say they're the Lord's. But handsome is as handsome does. And look what they're doing. True? True. That's why I'm in this ministry at the moment. That's why I'm here. Because I believe that if there could be in my life and in your life through the teaching of the Word, and many of you here tonight know the Lord, greater purity in our lives and greater holiness in our lives, thousands, untold thousands, would be converted. But because we say one thing and do another, we hold up the blessing. So, it's a very serious thing. The mark, the visible mark of the secure church of Christ, the fact that it's there, are godly lives. And that's one thing that Satan can't counterfeit. There are lots of New Testament signs that the Christians had which Satan can counterfeit in his own. You remember in the Old Testament, they could produce rivers of blood and so on, the magicians. So there are many signs in the New Testament that can be counterfeited. But there's one New Testament sign that Satan can't reproduce. And what's that? A fellow or a girl who is truly godly. He just can't produce it. He can produce all kinds of manifestations and hysteria and emotions and all the rest of it, but he can't produce a godly life. 
If I remember right, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States trying to find forged dollar bills, make their agents study a dollar bill, if I remember right, eight hours a day for five days a week. All they do is look at the dollar bill for eight hours a day. With a cup of coffee now and again. And I can tell you something after looking at that for quite a few weeks. <laughs> they can tell a forged dollar bill. Now, if an unconverted person were to come home with me tonight to my house, to my home, and walk with me until next Tuesday, everywhere I go and everything I do and think and say, and just look at Derek Bingham for eight hours a day for the next seven days. I wonder what he would see. I wonder what he'd say. He's forgery, that fella. He's not the real thing. But you see, folks, the plain fact of the matter is that by and large they are looking at us. They don't read the Bible much except at funerals and weddings. But they look at you. You say you know the Lord. So they say, well, if this is what a Christian is, let's watch him. 24 hours of every day we're in the witness box. We never come out of it. Say, friend, what is the gospel according to you? What are they reading? They took note of these New Testament Christians that they had been with Jesus. Is that what they're saying of us? And that's why now that the allusion is made in this chapter, verse 19, to the Old Testament. And I just asked the Lord to give me grace to do this tonight. I don't think, you know, we'll read half enough of the Word of God in public. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture to you now, and I want you to turn to it. Number 16. Now, you say you're wondering, Derek. No, I'm not. These two statements, the Lord knows his own, and the paraphrase, holiness marks the true believer, is these two statements are taken from Numbers chapter 16. That's where they're taken from. You'll find it in verse 5, and you'll find it in verse 26, but I want to read the context. Now, I want you to listen to this, because I can tell you, here's a mind-bender, if ever there was one. Maybe some of you have never read this passage in your lives before. May the Lord speak to all our hearts. God is not joking when he says this. I know who are truly mine. And if you are mine, depart from iniquity. Now Korah, the son of Izar, number 16 and 1, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Ab Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the sons of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you. Seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and said unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do. Take you censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. 
And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, you sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the Lord God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to him to do the service of the tabernacle to the Lord, of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? God's given you, fellas, your ministry to do. Is that a small thing to you? And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren and the sons of Levi with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? For what cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord? And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, No, we're not coming up. We will not come up. It is a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness. Is it a small thing you've done this? Except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey or given us inheritance of the fields and vineyards. And wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow, and take every man a censer and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord every man a censer, two hundred and fifty censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man a censer, put fire in them, let incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And Moses, the Lord, spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed them. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. Now you see, Moses is trying to find out who are the lords and who aren't, because these fellows are trying to say, You're not really, because... You're only trying to lord over us. This is a mighty moment. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain to them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. It came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them. And they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. So I think you can see very clearly from this passage, friends, in verse 5, notice it, of this chapter you've just read, tomorrow the Lord will show who are his. his. And in verse 26, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in their sins. Now, that is the chapter that Moses was think, or, or Paul was thinking about as he lay in Nero's cell about to be executed. Isn't it amazing how the Word of God flashes into your mind and how God can use it? 
And he applies that very image. Let's go way back, thousands of years now forward. Let's go right again into our Bibles to 2 Timothy. And going back to 2 Timothy, let's get a hold of it in the passage again. 2 Timothy 2. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, just as it did back in the days of Moses. The Lord knows those that are his. And if you are the Lord's, you'd better depart from iniquity, and especially those that are leading the people into iniquity. So that's a very solemn verse, isn't it? Now, Paul's a great teacher. Again, he's a great man for giving you a change, a relief in his teaching. He picks up another metaphor yet again. I think it's this, the fifth one in this lovely chapter. And he says, now the foundation of God will stand sure, and you'd better be holy in the way you live. You'd better be pure. Now, he takes another image to try and show what purity is. And he moves us into this uh, image of the stately home in verse 20. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, let me rightly divide this. Here you have a beautiful stately home, a great house, a great mansion. And there are within this mansion utensils of different kinds, pots, pans, dishes, and all the utensils of the great house but they are, says Paul, divided into two groups. There are vessels of gold and vessels of silver for noble use. J.B. Phillips, I think, calls it in this verse for special occasions. And in particular, for the personal service of the master of the house. And then there are other vessels of wood and earthenware, uh, which, apart from being of a cheaper quality, they're resumed for menial use, ignoble use in the house, maybe in the kitchen or the scullery. And it always reminds me of my friend Bob Christie of Filey fame. Some of you know him. And Bob told me one day at Filey about the little Scottish woman who prayed in the prayer meeting in the church. Lord, she said, some of us, Lord, are vessels of gold. Some of us, Lord, are vessels of silver. Some of us, Lord, are vessels of wood. And you know, Lord, some of us are just plain mugs. <laughs> yeah, that may be true. I can't say it like Bob can say it. But I think there's more here than just that kind of statement. I don't think that this represents spurious members of the Christian church and genuine members of the Christian church. Rather, let's put it in the context of this mighty passage. I think he's still referring to false teachers and true teachers. There are vessels of gold and silver. The vessel of gold, the vessel of silver can stand the heat of the fire. The wood and the earthenware burn up when God's test comes on it. And Paul is still referring to these two sets of teachers that he's contrasted before. You see, it is an incredible privilege for a Christian to work for the Lord. It is a great privilege in verse 21. You tonight sitting here can be used as a vessel of honor for the Lord all over the world and in Belfast. Fellas and girls sitting before me tonight as your future stretches out in front of you. As it lies away out there, the years and months ahead of the Lord be not come. I'm going to make a plea tonight. I'm going to make a plea. That you see, if you're a believer in this meeting, that the Lord has a great work for you to do. Because he has. A great future for you in his will. Who could ever tell me that the Lord would not have blessing for you? No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And it stretches out before you there, fellas and girls and men and women. Work to do for the Lord. 
scripture. What else is there? What else is there? You know that because you're a believer, many of you. Believers, many of you. You know that this whole world is an empty place. You know that its rewards are fickle. And only what's done for the Lord Jesus will last. You know that. Well, knowing that and the future stretching out in front of you, God is saying to you, because I don't think this was just written to Timothy. I think this was written to this class and to me as well. And to all of you listening by video and audio, wherever you are in the world, listen. If you're a Christian, here is a message for you. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Here's a tremendous work for you to do, but there's a condition. You have to purify yourself, because it says in verse 21, if a man or a person therefore purge themselves from these, he shall be this. So, I can't escape it, can I? The vessel that will be used for noble use, set apart, serviceable for the Lord, and ready for every good work, is there any higher honor than that, has a condition. It must be a clean vessel. And there is some kind of reference here to self-purification as the indispensable condition of being useful to the Lord. Now, you can't escape it. There is some kind of self-purification that is absolutely necessary if you're going to be really useful for the Lord. You say, is that so? Yes, it is. Because it says in verse 21, if any man purge himself from these. Now, who's that from these? Well, the from these is obviously, in the context of Timothy, Hymenius and Philetus, the false teachers on what they stand for. These men who are denying the fundamentals of the gospel and have lapsed into unrighteousness, you've got to pull away from that and not be associated with it. You've got to purge that from you. And I think to us tonight, the application is we've got to purge ourselves from falsehood. We've got to purge ourselves from wickedness in our hearts and in our lives and with those with whom we're associated because purity is the necessary condition of being serviceable for Christ. Or as my mom used to put it, son, purity is power. Now, I know that sometimes the Lord has used impure vessels to his glory. You say a contradiction. No, God used Assyria, a heathen nation, to chasten Israel. And God used the Babylonians to take them into captivity to chasten Israel. They were not pure vessels, I can tell you. But that was God using nations to chasten his people. That was national rather than personal. Here we're talking about something that's personal. If you are going to be personally used of the Lord, the condition is you've got to be a clean vessel. And there is no doubt that the overwhelming emphasis of Scripture is that God chooses to use clean vessels, instruments of righteousness. Now, I know that you've been forgiven if you've trusted the Lord as your Savior and you're cleansed in Him. And that if you're saved, you cannot be lost. We've taught that and we stand for it with all our hearts. Once in Christ, in Christ forever, thus the eternal covenant stands. No man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. You're safe, and in Christ you're clean. But does that mean you can do as you like? I'm saved now. I'm cleansed through the blood of Christ. I've got nothing to do. No. Notice that there is an application here that we have to get on with. He's very practical. He says, Timothy, I'll tell you how you'll be a clean vessel, useful to the Lord. Well, you, you remember Alan Redpath put it, you can have a saved soul and a wasted life. Of course you can. But if you want to avoid having a saved soul and a wasted life, the first thing you must do if you want to be useful for the Lord, a vessel of gold and silver for a noble purpose for him. Verse 22, you've got to run, flee from youthful lusts. You've got to flee, Timothy. Now, that's negative. You've got to run. 
Now, very often, in fact, up until this study, I really believed that all that really was talking about was sexual lust. Flee youthful lust. And sexuality is very high in a young person, particularly in a young person. And I always thought, well, he's saying there, you know, well, that rules out pornography, and that rules out um, premarital sex, and that rules out um, impure thinking, and so on. That must, the sacredness of womanhood in a fellow's mind must be absolutely uppermost, and uh, in a girl's mind, the sacredness of femininity, and uh, so on, and purity, and morality must be very, very high. But, you know, there are a lot more things in youth than just lust. Please notice there's nothing wrong with sexuality as such. I am always telling you that sex was not invented in Hollywood, thank the Lord. It was the Lord who invented it. He is for it. He invented it. He brought it about. It is sacred. It is wonderful. It is a gift from Him. But there are rules and laws set around it to preserve it, that it might be wonderful and fantastic and enjoyable and a blessing. Rules that he has laid down in his word. But let me get on. In youth, it's not just impurity in morality that is the only sin of youth. What about self-aggression? Did you ever watch 50,000 fellows coming from a football match and stand on the road as they come home? Drinking their lager and their beer? Dear help you if you get in the way. Or the opposing team get in the way. Not only that, you look all around you. One of the great problems of youth is self-assertion. One of the great problems of youth is self-indulgence. The vast majority of films on TV about young people play up self-indulgence. If it tastes good, taste it. Feels good, do it. Selfish ambition I traveled with a fellow one day, not long ago, a long way. And I asked him about his future plans. And boy, he wanted to go here, and he wanted to go there, and he wanted to do this, and he wanted to do that, and the sky was the limit. And he never mentioned the Lord. Never once. Headstrong obstinacy, arrogance. These are the problems of youth. But when the Lord Jesus comes into a young person's life, and is enthroned in a fellow and girl's heart, then all that fire of youth can be channeled for him, and they become a blessing wherever they go. Don't you let anybody despise you, Timothy, just because you're a young person. Don't you let those older men despise you. You fulfill your ministry. Here was a young man who knew the Lord, and the Lord gave him power over the sins of youth. There are sins of middle age, you know. I suppose I'm coming into that bracket now. Sorry, Ivor, but that's the way we are, you and I. Isn't it true? There are sins that we have. Don't think I'm standing up here being arrogant, saying, oh, you young people. No, no. There are peculiar sins to various stages in life. We have our own. May God preserve us from going, growing older arrogantly. And probably one of the greatest sins of middle age fellows in middle age, coming into their 40s and so on, is ambition. And all kinds of things that come in then in old age. A lady in Manchester sat recently in her 70s, and she wept to me by the fire. She said, you know, Derek, she said, don't you think it's just young people and young men who have problems with sins? Old people have it too. I am a sinner. Now I flee from all of those things. Now, the word is, seek safety in flight. You remember Moses fled from Pharaoh when he murdered the filler in the sand? You remember Joseph and Mary fled from Herod's wrath? You remember that the Bible says that sinners are urged to flee from the wrath to come? 
So Paul is saying, you recognize that sin is dangerous to your soul, Timothy. Flee from all of those sins of youth. Don't linger in their presence. You see, there was Lot stuck in Sodom. And the angels said, we're going to wipe it out. We're going to destroy it. Now get out. And the Bible says, while he lingered, they laid hold on his hand. And they dragged him out, set him out of the city. He stood there knowing that God kept his word. Couldn't have been a nephew of Abraham and not known that. He knew that God would destroy it. Yet he stood in that city and the Bible records for us that he lingered. He hung back. He lingered. And I wonder tonight, are some of you lingering? Lingering with sin. Terrible thing. We are to get as far away as possible from it and as quickly as possible, just like Joseph did when the woman tried to seduce him. She left his coat in her hand and he ran for it. Flee, youthful lust. Ah, but there's the positive. Amat is the meaning of verse number 22. Amat, go after, like a hunter goes after, uh, goes after his, uh, what he wants to catch, his prey. He pursues it like an army pursuing another army in flight. That is the meaning of the word. In hot pursuit of righteousness, faith, love, peace. My, if young people and middle-aged people and older people and old people were to pursue with all of their heart righteousness, faith, love, and peace, what a blessing there would be in the church. Will you pursue it? Flee from the other thing. But the positive side is run from spiritual danger, but run after spiritual good. Crucify the flesh, but walk in the Spirit. Be ruthless in your rejection of one in combination with being relentless in the pursuit of the other. That's the secret of holiness. You want the secret of holiness? There it is. Flee youthful lusts, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And here comes another metaphor. We move away from the utensils in the house to verse 23, to the servant in the house. And here's the servant in the great house, and I think the house must be the church of Christ. Here's the Lord's servant. And he is not to spend his time with word battles, verse 23. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. They breed quarrels. Don't have word battles. Don't spend your time in useless speculation. Sometime when I'm sitting with folk and they start to speculate and they start getting heckles up about speculation, and it's just speculation about the Bible, I just quit. I say nothing and get on with something positive and try to turn the conversation around to something positive. That's the only way out of that that breeds quarrels. Profitless argument in Ulster is a great problem in which one man's opinion is as good as another's. If you want to know why Ulster's got trouble, just ask any Ulsterman what he thinks the solution to our problems are. Ha! Ask him. And then ask the next guy beside him and the next one down the line. Sometimes I think the Welsh love the gospel because they can sing about it. Sometimes I think that the English love the gospel because they can talk about it. Sometimes I think the Scots love it because it's for nothing. But sometimes I think the Irish love it because they can have a good argument and a good fight about it. No, no. What kind of a man is this servant in the house? The servant of the Lord must not strive. The fundamental characteristic of a person who is the Lord's servant is gentleness. That's what it says. Verse 24. If you're a servant of the Lord, then you are to be gentle unto all men. Gentleness. Endowed with a gift or an aptitude for teaching. Sometimes you'll have to be negative, sometimes you'll have to be positive, but you must not be quarrelsome. You must be patient. When people bring evil against you, then you must learn not to resent it. You must forbear their unkindness. 
You must be like your Lord. When you meet a bruised reed, you don't tramp over it. When you meet a smoking flex, you don't put it out. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. God's perfect servant, look at him being led to Calvary. And Paul says, now, Timothy, I'm about to die, and you're the Lord's servant. A word from my heart to yours. You must be like your Lord. You must be patient. You must be gentle. You must not be quarrelsome. And you must, above other, all other things, be gentle. And what will God do through this gentle ministry? Well, verse 25, when people start to oppose what you say, in meekness he will answer. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Your teaching will not be the thing that does it ultimately. God will use it, but it'll be God who will bring them to repentance. Now, notice the acknowledgement of the truth is in consequence to their repentance. Everybody knows that our belief conditions our behavior. What you believe conditions how you behave. But I'm afraid not everybody is so clear that our behavior also conditions our belief. Just as violating your conscience can lead to a disturbance of your faith, so repentance from your sin will lead you to acknowledge the truth. When you say, Lord, I'm wrong, and I've been following those youthful lusts, and I haven't been gentle and patient, and you admit it, and you repent of it, then you will see the truth of what we learned in the Sermon on the Mount of turning the other cheek, of doing good to those who bring evil against you. What will happen? Because those who oppose themselves, if peradventure God will give them repentance, that they, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You see, Satan drugs people, if you like. I'm told that I'm told the meaning of that verse 26, recovering themselves out of the snare of the devil, is as a drunk man becoming sober, is as a drugged fellow coming back to his senses again. Because Satan has many, many people drugged. Many, many people are duped by him. Yet, if with gentleness and meekness and kindness you go on giving them the Word of God, gently telling them what God says, avoiding word battles and arguments, ah, said the woman at the well, you see, that mountain over there, Lord, you see, we think that's the one to worship, but you Jews, you think that's the place to worship there in Jerusalem. And the Lord said, he just swept through the cobwebs of denominationalism and sectarianism, or whatever you like to call it, and he said, God is seeking those to worship him in spirit and in truth. And one day it'll neither be in that mountain or that mountain, it'll be in the heart. See how the Lord cut through it all and didn't get into word battles with her. Very, very important. Diabolical intoxication is holding this city by the throat. What are we to do as a church of Christ? Rise up as servants of the Lord. And God can deliver them and bring them to repentance where they will acknowledge the truth as it is in Jesus. And he effects the rescue through the human ministry of one of his servants who avoids quarreling and teaches with kindness and forbearance and gentleness. So let's be a vessel of gold and silver and let's be a good servant in the house. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for this mighty passage of Scripture. We pray that thou wilt search us tonight and all our hearts, challenge us, bless us. We pray that many who are under the intoxication of Satan may be brought to their senses. And the Lord, especially those of us who know you tonight, will take the challenge of this passage. Be pure for God, young man, young woman. Help us to be pure vessels, meet and fit for the Master's use. We ask it for Jesus' sake. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. 137, please. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. Fill, I love that, fill me with fire where once I burned with shame, but especially the second line on the second verse, fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Standing, please. We'll sing the whole hymn.